Thank you very much. It's really nice of you. Putting this on stone. That's okay with you. Oh, yes, absolutely. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Thank you. I really What's that? Well, who gave the introduction? Hey, I missed the first part of that. <laughs> Heather's fondness for floral arrangement blossomed at a young age. She developed a knack for uprooting flowers from the family garden and neatly arranging them in her jewelry box, much to her mother's dismay. <laughs> During her four years at Emerson College, she juggled her studies with a full-time job as flower designer, squeezing in a party or two along the way. <laughs> Heather spent the next 20 years as an advertising executive and working most weekends designing flora for weddings and special events. Buying her first home in Medford in 2005, Heather finally had the opportunity to cultivate her own flower gardens, <clears throat> design her own flower boxes, and learn how to contend with the range of zero to full shade conditions. She began designing window boxes and planters for friends and soon had requests from her friends' friends. When the Medford Boat Club asked Heather to design 40-plus containers in 2014, she took the proverbial plunge, uprooting her advertising career to launch a new business, Flower Box Gardens. Thank you. So I'd like you to welcome Heather Usabo, better also known as Heather Smith. <laughs> My stage name. <laughs> I don't have a storefront or anything like that. I work out of my home, and everything I do is custom. So I always go to the client's home business site, whatever it is, and I design custom, you know, plant designs for them, whatever their needs are. So I am sometimes purchasing containers, I am filling existing containers, I am cleaning up and fixing existing containers, and I'll talk about all those different scenarios. All right, so what I thought I would do is I have a presentation that I'm going to walk through with you, and you all have copies of some, I have a few more slides that you'll see on the screen that you don't have, but it's only to make some photos larger and to talk through them in a little bit more detail. So you're not really missing anything on the handout. Does everyone have a handout? No. Okay, let me get, make sure you have one. There's some extras over here. Wonderful, thank you. You got one? Is anyone missing one? You need one. <laughs> There you go. All right. Oh, I'll give you these in case anybody shows up. And there are more on the food refreshment table over here as well. So I'm going to walk through the presentation. As you can see, I have some plants here and some containers with only soil. So we'll do a demonstration after we go through the presentation here. And I will be looking for volunteers if anyone's interested. No pressure. But it would be more fun if you want to do your own. And I have gloves in different sizes, so <laughs> so we're not all getting you know too too dirty here. So when we start container design, of course we start with the container, and there are lots of different kinds. And sometimes it can be confusing and overwhelming, right, to decide where do I start, what kind of container. There's fiberglass. There's also something called fiber X. And what that means is it's a fiberglass combined with something else. So there's fiber stone and all these different kinds, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. There's PVC, which is a, a great option. 
Um, I am custom designing a PVC window box for a client this year. And what it is, is it looks like wood, but it is not wood. So it will not rot over the long term. So it's a really nice option. Then there's wood. I just did a pretty good size installation using wood containers, and I'll talk about that. But if you're going to use wood, I would definitely recommend using cedar because it will not rot. It's very long lasting and it looks beautiful just as it is. It can be stained and painted, but I definitely don't recommend it because it's so gorgeous just like it is and it weathers really nice as well. There's plastic, there's terracotta. I actually really love terracotta. <laughs> I have it when I do my own containers for my home on my back deck, they're all terracotta, all of them. But as we all know, they do break down over time. So. Um, then there's tall, there's short containers, there's square, there's round. How do I choose? Like, how, how do I know which is going to be the best solution? So some of the things that I think about when I'm considering what kind of container am I going to purchase for, you know, a particular home or business, I consider budget first and foremost. How much do they want to spend? Because... You know, some of these fiber stone combinations and some of these sizes are unbelievably expensive, as you, you know, may or may not know. Um, I look at environment. You know, what does the home look like? What does the business look like? You know, what's going to be the right material that's going to re really blend in nicely with this particular home or environment? Is customization required? Um, if customization is required, and I'll talk about, um, you know, this in a little more detail, can I... Is it on a hill? Do I need to prop it up? Does it need to be leveled? In which case I might use wood or I can actually level it, build a custom trim so that everything looks neat and clean from the outside. So that's another consideration. Then there's color. What color is the home? Do I want to use a bright red container on a white, white home? Maybe that's not something that they want. Am I going to limit myself with a color container? I do have a client, the Medford Boat Club, in fact, where we have bright blue containers. But I'll talk about why that choice was made. So sometimes it makes sense. Um, metal, and I have here no metal. I do not ever recommend metal. The reason why is because if you have metal sitting, especially in a sunny location, the sun will beat on that metal, it heats it up, and it gets so hot that ultimately it will burn your root system and it will kill the plant. So in shady locations, maybe, but there are so many great options out there that metal is usually not something that I go with. Um, I also look at in my decision making is long or short term solution. You know, is this something that is just for a season, in which case it doesn't matter what material you use. Is this something that's going to be sitting on a sidewalk for the next 10 years? Well, that's something to think about, you know, as far as you know, decision making for your containers. Any questions on that before I move on? All right, so the next thing is tools. What are the different kinds of tools that I'm using when I'm putting together containers? So I actually have some examples and I will pass them around, but one is the garden trowel. I have them over, I'm everywhere. Sorry, it won't help for the video, will it? Oh, you're on, you can move, all right. <laughs> So there's the garden trowel, which is the one I think I probably use the most. And I think we all are familiar with the trowel. So it helps for um, taking old plants out of containers, just for loosening up soil, all these different things. Now, this is my favorite trowel. So I hope it makes its way back. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, it has serrated edges. Oh, you notice that. So the, re and the way I use this, and I use the garden knife the same way, is that if I have a, let's say, like a one-gallon perennial that I've purchased and I'm putting it into a container and it's been sitting in this plastic container for a really long time and the magic of what makes professional containers look as amazing as they do is we use a lot of plants, and I mean a lot of plants, and I'll talk about that. So when I take the plant out of the plastic container, it, it, it's just going to go everywhere, yeah. So it, keep, it keeps the size, and sometimes the soil is not loose, and, it, and I'm shaking all the dirt out of it, so I have just the roots left to plant into new soil. Well, sometimes it doesn't come apart so easily. You've probably had that experience. So I use my serrated edge trowel, 
or my garden knife, and this has a much sharper edge to it, which you'll see, I'll pass it around so you can see what it's like. And I literally saw it down, all four sides or sometimes just two sides, depending on what it is that I'm doing, to help make this, you know, this part in here much smaller so I can fit it inside the container. Does that make sense? So these are my favorite tools. So I'll pass these around. This one's really sharp. You can get a look at it. <laughs> what did she say? Oh, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> and you can really feel the difference on those, right? Of course, we all know our pruners, right? So I don't. I mean, I can pass these around, but I don't know if I'll really bother. Yep. And then I have scissors and cutters that I use. I use these a lot. And I also use, do you use drams at all? These are one of my, this is my other favorite. In addition to the garden knife, this is one of my favorite tools. It is so sharp. So I kept it in the package. Um, I'm happy to open it, you know, I'm sure it's fine. But I use these for doing things like when I'm putting a container, you know, planting con a container, and I'll, I have a good example of this in a little bit, that has a really tall ornamental grass, and sometimes it's a bit unruly, I have to give it a haircut. So these are some of the tools that I use. And I use them all the time for lots of different things. Like, for example, I have some weed mat in here, and I'll explain why I use this. And I use these kind of scissors to cut it back and things. So these are the tools that I always, always, always have in my bag, including the pruners. I'm not going to bother with the pruners. Like, we all, I mean, I have like 10 pairs of these things. So, but I'll pass these around. I'll close it so that... And then uh, you can pass those around the drams. The drams are so great. They're so sharp. They cut through things I couldn't imagine. <laughs> Any questions about tools, about those tools so far? No? All right. So landscape mat is something that I use often. And this, we don't need landscape mat all the time. But where it's helpful is so you have your container and then you have your drainage material. So that could be you know, rocks or broken pieces of another pot. Sometimes I've done that, like if I, because I use terracotta a lot in my own home, and they crack and they you know, fall apart over time. And so sometimes I'll take a hammer to it, break it into smaller pieces, and I save those pieces and use them as drainage material. You can use anything for drainage material. Um, you have a broken dish at your home, use that you know, anything. What I use a lot, especially if I have a really, really large container, very, very tall, is I'll take these plastic cups that the plants come in and I squish them all down and I use that as drainage material as well. I so, water bottles too. yeah, water bottles, that's another one. Those are all really wonderful, you know, options for your drainage material. So what can also help to keep things from being a little less messy and to keep your soil separated from your drainage material is once you have your plastic bottles, your broken terracotta or what have you, put landscape mat down. What this actually is, is weed mat. I bought this at Home Depot, so you can find it as well. I won't pass this around because it's enormous, but I'll pass a little example around, but I'll leave it up here if you want to come take a look at it. This is it without the, you know, the plastic. So what happens is when you, you separate the soil, you can pass that around so you get a sense, the water, um, the water goes through it, but the, the soil does not. So you know how sometimes the, the rocks and the roots and the soil, when you empty a container, they all become one, and then you don't really have good drainage anymore. <coughs> this solves that problem keeps them separate, but still allows the water to come through. Make sense? Um, spray paint is another tool that I use a lot. Um, I have, and I'll talk about this in a minute, I had a client with 40 plus containers, and they were all different sizes, all different colors, and I wanted to group them. And I was thinking, I can't make any sense out of this. <laughs> so I used spray paint, and I got this at Home Depot. 
It's just Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch. That's it. And, um, you know, use this to touch up a container. I also will, um, you know, for a couple of clients, and I'll, I'll talk about this in examples in more detail in a couple of minutes, to, you know, clean up an existing container that somebody wants to keep. You know, something that I had a client last summer. She has a, a pool and this gorgeous, huge yard, and she has this container. She goes, I really love it, but it's such a mess. I'm like, give it to me. <laughs> I will make it new. <laughs> All I did is paint it. Yeah. And, and it really does look brand new. Um, and then, of course, my drill. So if you have a container without any, any, um, any holes in it for drainage, then you have to really give it some holes for drainage. So, so I use my you know, trusty drill for that. Um, if we don't have any drainage in our containers, I mean, what's going to happen? Does anyone know? Mm -hmm. Root rot. Root rot. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, so, and then the plant dies. So then, then, then where are we? Look, I have soil all over my laptop. <laughs> Sorry, there's soil all over. It's not my husband who brings the dirt in the house. It's me. <laughs> So when I have my container, I've got that figured out. I've got my drainage material, my landscape mat, and my soil. Now I have to figure out what plants I'm going to put in this. So I wanted to talk a little bit. I didn't put this in the slide. Have you heard, uh, I see this term kind of a lot when I'm out in garden centers. It's called thrill, fill, and spill. Have you heard of this? Yes. Okay. So I see it a lot, and some people use that as a rule, and it's fine to use that as a rule. I don't use that as a rule. <laughs> I throw the rules away <laughs> and do my own thing, but it's not a bad basis. Um, thrill means use something really tall. Um, in the fall, I use, of or I use a lot of uh, ornamental grasses. I mean, you can use shrubs and all different kinds of things in containers if the container is large enough. Okay, that would be your thrill. Your fill would be, right, anything around that to fill it all in. And then the spill would be your trailers that are going over the sides. So it's not, a, like I said, it's not a bad rule to use, but sometimes thrill is too much. Sometimes I'm in front of a window and I don't want to block the window. So I got to take thrill out of the equation. Then, we're, then we go with fill and spill. <laughs> and sometimes spill doesn't really work either. So, um, but anyway, that, I at least wanted to acknowledge that since I've seen it around and I figured you probably had as well. So choosing plants. One thing we have to consider, of course, is light. Is this a full sun situation? Is it a full shade situation? Or is it a little bit of both? You know, and when is that happening? All right, so obviously I don't want to take you know, wave petunias and put them in a no sun situation because they're not going to be at their best. You know, it's just not going to work. I wouldn't want to take these gorgeous Rex begonias and put them in full sun because they'll burn, right? But literally, they turn brown, and it's just, it's a shame to do that to a Rex begonia. <laughs> I love those. Um, I think about color. So when I'm looking at it, I'm talking to a client and saying, is there a color that you hate or a color that you love? Um, if it's a home, I'm looking at the, the painting, like what color is the house painted? You know, what other plants do they have around? You know, how do we make this work with the home and the landscaping? Make it blend or maybe you want it to stand out. And why do you want a container here? Like, why are we doing this? Is, is there a big family event happening and you want to dress it up for the season? Or is this going to be something that's going to be here for a while? So these are the things to think about. Um, what type of container is it going in? Is it going into a really tall, you know, like a column container? Or is it going to be a lower, wider, you know, container, like square around or something? Or is it a window box? So these are all the things that I'm thinking about. Um, what behavior is this plant? Is it a trailer? Is it a thrill? <laughs> is it tall? Um, or is it something that really just fills in? You know, what is this plant going to look like in a month? That's really important to know because right now, I, I know someone asked, they want to know where I shop. I shop at Cavicchio a lot. Does anyone, you know Cavicchio? Okay. So if you don't know Cavicchio, it's a big um, wholesaler. It, not just anyone can buy there. You have to be a business of, of some sort. And um, they are, I love them. They're incredible. Um, but I was there the other day, and all of the plants, bless you, are this big right now, like teeny tiny, but they could be this big you know, in a couple of months. So it's important when you're selecting your plants 
to think about that. What is this going to look like in a month, you know? Um, so the example I put up here, it's hard to see the color, but you have it on your handouts as well. This is actually my house <laughs> that I've started off with. So what I have in here is I have some heuchera or coral bells is sort of the popular name. Um, it's one of my favorite filler plants. It has gorgeous foliage on it. Um, this has sort of like a purpley color to it. I have just ivy on the front of it. Um, I have some, I think it's an arborvitae I have in there, or maybe a uh, juniper. I have coleus on the top part of that. And what I did with the coleus is I kept cutting it down because some coleus, if you've used it, can get very large, very bushy, and very tall. And they get the spikes on it. So I cut them down to keep them just about the size that I want them. And I did put some ornamental grasses in there. So some of the decision making I had here is I think I probably had the coleus first and then filled in the rest. So the coleus, the leaf, had this sort of purpley color to it in the center. And I was thinking, what else can I use that has this dark purple that I can bring in, you know, add to fill out my window box? So I used the coral bells because it had a nice dark purple foliage. And you see that on the sort of the front on the ends, there's that purple, and it really matches nicely with the center of the coleus. My process when I'm at Cavicchio or I'm at Russo's or I'm at Mahoney because I shop there too. Um, any of these places is I take all of these things I just mentioned, I put them into consideration. I start with one plant and I say, oh, I think that would be really great. And I throw it on my cart and I walk around and I start adding other plants to it. And I say, oh, that really looks together. Oh, not so much, <laughs> you know, and put it back. So for example, here I did the same exact thing. I went to Mahoney's because they had, I wanted to go to Cavicchio's, but <laughs> everything's too small right now. Um, they have these larger Rex begonias, which is a wonderful shade plant, if you don't know. They have these like purpley, sort of pinky, you know, color to it. And then I took these, which is actually in the Calancho or Calanco family, and put them together, and the color is magic. I mean, the pink with the darker foliage, it just works so beautifully together. But that's all I did. As I just walked around, I said, oh, I've got to get, I have to get these. <laughs> I said, what can I pair with it? So I'm thinking, well, maybe something light. Since these are so dark, I don't want to go dark again. I want to really lighten it up. What's going to be a nice complementary color to go with this? Green is really nice. The name of these are actually Silver Scroll. So I didn't really play around with any white kind of silvery things like a Dusty Miller. Um, to see what that would look like. I went right to those when I saw them and stuck with it because I just thought the combination was really beautiful. We don't always have to combine. The other container that we're going to put together today is all dahlias. And I just love the particular shades and hues of these dahlias, but we're going to use a lot of them. So it's fine to stick with something you love, use a lot of it, and just really fill in your container. And that can really be stunning too. Any questions? All right, so now I thought it would go through all the seasons. And of course, we'll start with spring, because why not? We're here, <laughs> finally. Well, except for the snow last week, right? <laughs> I know, I know. So some spring tips. Um, so we know we're, as far as what plants we can use right now, we're fairly limited, right? So when I'm talking spring, I'm talking March and April. You know, I'm not really talking May yet. So we can use daffodils, we can use pansies, you know, we can use those kinds of things. So sun and shade location are not as big of a consideration when selecting your live plants for a spring container as they are in summer. In summer, it's a major consideration, right? So plants may grow considerably in spring, but maybe not. I mean, I put in some daffodils, some tete-a-tetes. The tete-a-tete -tete daffodils are the smaller ones. I mean, I put them in, they were this big. Oh, they were in, you know, in a week they were this big. So that's considerable, considerable growth for that plant. Some of them aren't going to grow very much at all. Like your pansy is going to grow a little bit, but it's not its nature to really get that large, right? So proper hydration is important. In the spring, this time of year, we don't want to water every day. Maybe once a week, you know, really watch the weather, that kind of thing. But it's important in spring not to overhydrate, right? And then, oh yeah, I say here that, you know, daffodils and pansies can tolerate snow or not. 
<laughs> yeah, that's my house. <laughs> I was so heartbroken. <laughs> yeah, so we all felt that this week, right? <laughs> so this is an example of a um, cedar containers that I put together for one particular client. So this example is a yellow twig dogwood. And the reason that I chose that is, well, for one, I had, I put, so this installation happened the first week of March. So it was quite a dance trying to find plants. So what I was doing is looking at different garden centers and going through their hoop houses. Have you seen these big fields and there's literally like this hoop house that's like a long tunnel. And I was walking all through fields, all through February, looking for plants that would feel springy, that had been outside in the cold. I didn't want something that was inside because if I take a plant that was inside and then put it outside in February or March, it's going to go like that. I needed something that has been outside for a long time. Okay, So the yellow twig dogwood was chosen because it had the right seasonal conditions. It feels more springy even though it certainly could put it in, in the winter as well. Um, and it was going against a brick wall. And it looked really beautiful against this brick background, okay? It was going into a cedar container. So it looked, the yellows looked really, really beautiful and complementary with the cedar container. And I used the palest, palest yellow violas I could possibly get my hands on to not overpower the yellow twig dogwood or to you know, have your, if, if I use like a dark purple or a blue, that's all you would see is the blue. But you have here the beautiful tones of a new cedar container, your yellow twig dogwood, which looks gorgeous against the brick, and a nice soft viola that supports the whole thing. Does that make sense? So the choice, do you have questions? Or are you all set? Oh, what a viola is? Oh, I'm sorry. A viola is like a pansy, only it's a bit smaller. Yeah, I, I, I chose the viola because it was a bit more delicate and a little, I thought it was, these in particular were very pretty. Yeah, I, I'm glad you think so, I was hoping so. <laughs> so for this particular location, I was putting in 42 feet of containers on a sidewalk outside a brand new construction site with a sidewalk that went like this. So I was thinking, well, what am I going to do here? I can't just take a fiber X or fiber glass container and drop it on a hill, and they're all going to look very messy and untidy. And this is in West Newton, so it was really important you know, <laughs> that we go with, you know, I mean, I would be like that anyway, but it, it, there was no way I could live with myself and just drop in containers on a sidewalk at a tilt like this. So what we did is we got out our levels, <laughs> We chose cedar because we could do some carpentry work and customize the container. So we leveled them all, brought them all up, um, put footing underneath them, and created a custom trim at the bottom of it. So visually, when you look at it, I mean, some are a little bit higher than others. There's not much we could do about that because I don't want them higher than the windows either. So there's a lot of different factors involved. But they all look level and they all look beautiful. So the details matter in these kinds of situations. So that's why cedar was chosen for this particular situation, because customization was required to make them all level. Summer tips. So sun and shade location are strong considerations, as we all probably know. I had talked about that a little bit before. We would not want to take a Rex begonia, put it in full sun. We wouldn't want to take you know, petunias and put them in full shade. So we really do need to think about that. Um, plants may grow considerably. In fact, a lot of them will grow considerably. So we need to think about what does it look like now as I look at it, but what's it going to look like in a month? Is it going to be six times the size or is it only going to grow a little bit? You know, those are big, big factors that we all have to think about. Proper hydration, incredibly important all the time. Um, but in summer, we want to water a lot more than we do in the spring, a lot more than we do in the fall. But sometimes we want to be careful about not overhydrating, like your ivy geraniums. You know, ivy geraniums are regular geraniums. You don't want to overwater them because you're going to have root rot. And they're not going to, you know, grow and perform as we hope. 
Um, ground covers, something I definitely want to, and, and I have some examples of this in, in future photos. Um, ground covers can be great in containers. Maybe not something that we're always thinking about. Um, I use lamium a lot last year. I use a lot of ajuga, bugleweed. Um, I love, that's one of my favorites. Um, all different kinds of sedum. So some sedum is trailing, some of it is upright. Those are really good considerations. Time. I use, a, I use herbs in some of my containers. So I, I have a couple of, yeah, properties, residences that I do all their containers and they, these two have swimming pools. They have a lot of guests and one has young kids. So I actually decided she has a pool house. So I put a couple of window boxes up in the pool house and I use chocolate mint mixed in with some of the flowers. So I thought the kids would love it. Until I get, a, you know, a, an email from the mom. She goes, "Those are great in mojitos." <laughs> <laughs> so they're great for kids and adults. <laughs> um, so you could also, if you have a really large container, you can use things like roses. Knockout roses are phenomenal in containers. Hydrangeas are great in containers as well. So when, you're, when I'm shopping for plants, I'm not just in the annual section. I'm in perennials. I'm in shrubs. You know, I go to all these different areas and look at what's going to be an, you know, that magical combination that I'm looking for. What's got the right light consideration? Yes? Uh, the hydrangeas. Am I yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't use them in a window box. Oh, I've okay. used them, so I oh, used yeah. them in a home. Yeah. Okay. I used them in a home where they had completely redone their stairway and front walkway and put permanent planters in, uh, okay. and they were long. So I and they were stepped. Mm -hmm. So I used a couple of hydrangeas. Oh. In, yeah. So they were only about this big, and then in the fall when I took them out, I replanted them somewhere else. Is what I did. So. Oh, okay. I wouldn't, and I, I have one of those too, you know, those hydrangeas. I could never put one of those huge, I mean, I'd never say never, because who knows, I'm doing a roof deck soon, so, oh, <laughs> so <laughs> with very large plants, so that would, ha that would be a, a very special kind of situation. Okay, so some examples, um, some, there are so many full sun plants, I couldn't, even begin to give a whole list. So I kind of put some things to think about, some of my favorites. Um, ornamental grasses are great. I just love them. Um, herbs, petunias, calabrocoa. Do you know what calabrocoa is? Okay, I use this a lot. I love, love, love them. It is, it's like, exactly. It looks like a baby petunia, okay? And it has a wave effect to it. So when you, when you find like a, you know, a container like this, eventually it's like this wide and going over the side of something. So if you need it, it's a, it's a good like bushy trailing. It doesn't trail too much. The Calabrocoa is a, is a favorite of mine. It comes in lots of really interesting colors and it's a really um, easy, easy, low maintenance plant. So it's a favorite. Lantana, great for full sun all the time and comes in some interesting combinations. And verbena, you know, people think lantana, they think verbena. There's so many more, but that was just sort of, you know, I thought there might be a couple names in there, things that maybe you didn't know about before. So when I talked about coloring containers or spray painting them, this is a really perfect example of that. So this is the Medford Boat Club. They have 42 plus containers there, and when I, when it got into my hands, there were lots of different ones, um, different colors, different shapes, different sizes, and I needed some uniformity. I'm like, how do I even manage all of this? Because I wanted to group some of them, and these are some of the groupings that I've done. So the Medford Boat Club isn't your typical boat club. It's really a kid beach club <laughs> is what it is. When you go there any day in the summer, there's hundreds of kids just running around. It's very relaxed environment. So it's really fun. And their, um, oh, forgive me, I should know this, is their flag. There's a specific name for the flag. I wonder if someone in here knows the name. Um, it, their colors are red, white, and blue. It's, it's, yes, thank you. <laughs> it's shameful that I didn't know that. <laughs> So I, we, I talked to the Commodore that year, the 
basically the president who's making all the decisions on this. And I said, why don't we go with a color and make it fun? And she loved it. So together we came up with this blue color and made every single container this bright blue and used this spray paint. So I literally laid all my tarps out on the beach area and spray painted every single container they had. And they all looked brand new. And when the guests or the members started arriving that year, they thought all the containers were brand new. Now, here's the problem with picking a bright color <laughs> like this for all your containers is you're going to limit yourself as far as plants go. I would never put a Rex begonia, probably, maybe, but not likely that I would use this in a bright blue container, right? So I went a lot with pink and yellow as theme colors last year, and it looked so nice with the blue. But you're going to limit yourself, you know what I mean? I don't know if I would do this in a home. You know what I mean? If you, there's maybe a pale yellow or a stone house and you give it like a bright blue or a bright red container, that's all you're going to see is the red. It won't even matter what plants, it won't even matter what plants you put in it because that's all the eye is going to be drawn to is that bright, bright, bright color. So it's important to be really careful about what color you decide to choose when you're going to spray paint your containers. Most of the time, honestly, I use black. Because <laughs> the colors look really nice against it. They really do sort of, you know, jump out. Um, this is another client who I took. Th this client did not have a really big budget for their containers, but they really needed to dress something up. This is an incredibly inexpensive container that I got at like Home Depot for like 30 bucks or something. It was black. I spray painted it a really, really dark purple to match her front door. And they look expensive. You know what I mean? It's an urn, so it looks expensive, you know what I mean? But it really isn't. So you can do a lot of neat little tricks. I'm giving all my secrets away here tonight. You can do a lot of really neat tricks. Oh, my goodness, I've gone on. I still have a lot more to talk about, and it's already 750. Um, that you can do with a can of paint, you know? So um, I get into sun and shade here. So things that work really well in both not full sun, not full shade, but something in between is hydrangeas, ivy geraniums, Solomon seal is something that I really like to use. I use heuchera all the time. I really wanted to bring one to show you today so you, I could show you how they work in containers. I just can't say enough about them. I have more pictures that display that. Um, Ligularia is a, per, is a perennial. Who would think of putting that in a container? You know, Tiarella, hostas, great in containers. Coleus, New Guinea impatiens. These are all viable options for a sun and shade, you know, that in-between kind of spot. I know some of you wanted to hear about shade. There, shade is my favorite. It is, and some people think, oh, I've got shade. I can't do anything. There's so much you can do. It's, it's incredible. Um, your Rex begonias, your begonias, your impatience, your hostas, your lamium, your ground cover. That's a shade plant. Your Solomon seal, your coleus, ferns. Oh, love ferns. Love working with ferns. Great shade plant. And your heuchera, you can use sun, shade, and everything in between. It is like the workhorse of the perennials out there. So some shade examples. Um, this is an example of um, one container at the Medford Boat Club. I know it's not blue. <laughs> There's one little section where all the containers are black because it's separate from everything else. Um, but in here, I use hostas. I use ferns. I use lamium, which is a ground cover but it has all these wonderful little pink and purple flowers. And I needed something a little unobtrusive because it's on a bocce court and it's, there's heavy, heavy traffic on this bocce court. So it needed to be understated, it needed to be simple, it needed to be beautiful, and it had to work in the shade. Um, more shade. Here is a client that has nothing but shade <laughs> in the front of her entire house. So we have a hanger and an archway. This is actually quite a large hanger. I have lavender and patience. I combined those with a really dark leaf heuchera or coral bells, which the, two, the color combination was really beautiful. Um, some astilbe I put on the container on her front stoop. I love using astilbe in containers in shade situations. Lamium again for some trailing in the container. Some heliotrope I used in the container sitting on the stoop. And strobilanthes is another one that I used in the hanger. This is why I gave you handouts. <laughs> so you can have the list. You can Google them all. 
Um, another shade option, really simple combination. Again, the Hugh Gressy, I have it like in everything. Um, painted fern, I love painted fern. It has those beautiful combination of some purples and some greens, and it looks really nice with like an obsidian heuchera, which is like a dark purple um, variety. And I put a sort of a reddish purplish Rex begonia next to some really light pink impatience. And the, the color combination was magical, yeah. And then of course you have your trusty begonias, and I put in here, I mean, this here, it, they don't even look real. But they're, I mean, when I talk about packing plants in, like really packing them in, that's the result that you get. You know what I mean? It doesn't even look real. It's like, how could you even accomplish that? Um, and then you have your trailing begonia, which you don't see these everywhere. And when I saw it, oh my God, like people around me were like, what does she know that I don't? <laughs> I grabbed them and I stuck them on my cart and I wouldn't let go of my cart like the whole time. So... <laughs> Yes. When you're packing so many plants, yeah. don't you have to water them more often? Um, that's a good question. Probably yes. I mean, that's probably true. You probably, you probably do have to water them more often. Yeah, I would say so. Because you have more, so many roots in there. I mean, the way that I look at it, everything I do is temporary. You know, so... it's I, I'm not doing gardens. I'm not planting shrubs and trees. And so... Any time, and everything I, pa I do in a container is really packed in. So summertime especially, water heavily, you know, but be judicious about it. Like if it's an ivy geranium kind of situation, then mm, let it dry out a little bit and then water it again. You know, some other things require a lot more water. You know, a lot of the, most of the annuals, I think like the petunias and all those prefer more water than less. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. I have a question about fertilizer. Would you fertilize? I don't want them to get bigger, bigger. Yeah, you know, I really don't. Um, I, I don't, like, nothing at the Metro Boat Club, for example, gets fertilized. Not a single thing. And everything just explodes. And what you know? do you use for soil? I just, you know, I, I'm not too fancy about it. Like I said, everything, like, if you're gardening, there's a lot you need to consider when it comes to soil. You know what I mean? There really is. Um, I put a new bag of just potting mix, you know, and I use, I buy most of my soil at Cavicchio because I use a fair amount of it and it's going to be less expensive there for me. Yeah. I just use a complete container mix, like whatever it is that they have. Yes. Does that have the fertilizer in it? Because I've seen now that they have fertilizer yeah. in your potting soil. They have like the perlite in there. It's hard, it's kind of hard to find a soil without it unless you, you're going with probably the organics and, you know, and so forth. Yeah, they have, it's a mix of all different, absolutely, a mix of all different kinds of things in there. But I mean, since everything I do is temporary for the most part, um, I just am putting new soil in, you know what I mean? Fresh soil every year. You know, that kind of thing. I'm not getting into soil testing. I don't have to worry about fertilizing, you know, for the perennials that come back every year. It's not something that I have to, you know, put into consideration when I'm choosing my soil. So fall. I have, kind of have a few for fall because it's my favorite season. Um, sun and shade considerations are less of an issue, just like in the spring, right? I mean, you're not going to get a lot of growth with plants that you're putting in there. So... And the ornamental grasses that I'm buying for a new fall installation are already really large. They're not going to grow anymore. So everything that I'm buying is what you see is what you're going to get, <laughs> pretty much. Um, and, of course, we talk about hydration. We do not want to overwater in fall. Same thing with the spring. Maybe once a week. If we get a hot week, maybe two or three times, kind of watch the soil, see, you know, what happens. And as we know, the plants will tell you... <laughs> Because if they start to droop a little, they're like, hey, over here, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> so some of my fall favorites are, of course, the ornamental grasses, top the list. Lots of different kinds of ornamental grasses. And, I talk about, and I'll talk about some things that we can do with those instead of just sticking them in a pot and walking away. We can have some fun with those. Um, of course, the heuchera is going to come up, the juga or the bugleweed. Ferns, lots and lots of ferns, sedum. Gora is something that I love, and it's one of my favorite um, perennials. It looks kind of, some varieties of the Gora look like an ornamental grass and have lots and lots of these tiny little pink or white flowers on them, 
um, def I would definitely look it up on the list so you all can sort of digest it. It's still be Lakothwe Semi Evergreen has some really interesting varieties and interesting foliage, which can look really magical in containers. Um, Euphorbia, you'll see some Euphorbia on there, I'll show you. Um, and some euonymus. I mean, these are kind of some funky, it's like, wow, no, no, if I would think about putting that in a container. Um, but these are things to look at. Like when you're walking around the yard and you're walking around the garden center and you're trying to make choices, um, consider these as options. And you might surprise yourself with the combinations that you can put together. All right, so this is one example. Um, I, this is a home that I, uh, is a client of mine in Chestnut Hill in Brookline. And there's a lot, I actually selected and put these containers in. Um, she wanted metal, and I recommended, you know, not to use metal because they get a fair amount of sun here, and it would kill the plants like that. Um, so if you look at the front of the home, there's a lot of stonework. Um, I didn't want to give her anything loud. She likes a lot of structure. Her house is, everything is white in there, so she's, you know, she's, got a specific taste that I was picking up on. She likes modern, she likes clean, she doesn't like loud. Um, so I took photos, I put them photos in front of her and she loved this container. And if you look at, if, I don't know if you can see the shot on your handouts, the containers look like they're part of the home. And that's the way it should, I mean, that's the way I wanted this to look in this particular situation. Um, she, so for this fall, the plants that are inside this one, you have the list, but I have um, a couple of tall grasses. I have the heuchera, which are down toward on the sides on the front because it's a sort of a, a shorter, you know, bush here. But it has, I use a, a, an absolute ton of heuchera or corabels in the fall because there are so many different varieties and it looks like fall foliage. There was one that I actually used at, at a restaurant and bar called Pinot Gris. <laughs> I was like, how do you not do that? <laughs> and it had these lovely, you know, wine, burgundy, and green, and it, they looked like, you know, fall foliage like on a maple tree or something like that. So and with all these varieties, you can really do a lot with them. Um, the euphorbia, in this case, I use an ascot rainbow. So the euphorbia in this photo, you see that kind of bright greenish, maybe yellowish clump in there? That's the euphorbia. And so, yeah, I was, I was actually, I think I grabbed those at Cavicchio once. They, at Cavicchio, they have huge containers in the fields, and there was a euphorbia sitting in the planter. I ran over, and I pulled it out, and I stuck it on my cart. <laughs> so, hey, it was for sale. <laughs> um, fern, I used, it's, this was just a, like a basic green, you know, kind of fern that you're used to seeing. And I stuck some chrysanthemum in there just for a little bit of, you know, color, but there's not a lot of bright color here, and you have a lot of color. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can really create color just with foliage, you know, not necessarily with a bright colored flower. Um, that, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, that is a, a Fiber X or a Fiber Stone container. Mm -hmm. And I actually had to drill mm -hmm. holes in those, um, which was not, it was not for the, it was very stressful. <laughs> Because you had, I had to use a very, I had to use a huge drill bit. I had to go very, very slow because I didn't want to crack the container. Mm -hmm. And if I crack the container, then it's on me. And those are very, very expensive containers. So I really didn't want to uh, deal with that. If you do not put drainage in a container like this, um, what could happen is it can actually explode. So yeah, so what happens is it fills up with water. You have ice, you know, over the winter, oh, sure. and it expands, and then it'll explode. Yeah. Okay, so that can be an incredibly dangerous kind of situation. So this is just a closer look. Um, I, I think these are some photos. Put some extras in that you don't see on your slides. Yes. So if you're kind of this large, would you use a false bottom? Um, it's so. What do you do? You mean like there's no bottom on it at all? No, like well, you, you just put something high. halfway so that yes. you're not putting twice as much soil. Yes, base. that is exactly what I did. Okay. That thing is at least half full of, oh, all kinds of things. <laughs> A lot of these cups, you know. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, they're not going to move, but there's no need to have all that soil in there. Right. Thank you for bringing that up. I should have mentioned that. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Was there another question? Um, 
When you poop holes in the bottom and it drains out, wouldn't yeah. that, I was thinking too, yeah. so, so, you know, wouldn't that, uh, you know, dirty up the, uh, where it's sitting? That, I'm so glad you mentioned that. That is where this is important. So I put a great deal of landscape mat. So I put all of that drainage material about at least halfway up, and then I filled the entire thing with the landscape mat or the weed block. It's really all it is. Yeah. So it keeps it clean. There is water out there, but this particular client has an irrigation system for all her containers. So and it's on a timer. So you know it gets watered. I know. <laughs> So there's actually the little hoses wrapped all around inside the container and that has like, it's like someone poked holes in them and they just spray and then they go on, you know, once a day or every other day or something like that. I have a question. Yes. I have a sister that has several metal containers and um, she's in a hot area now and she hasn't been using them for that. She's made them into water gardens, but yeah. the when she used them, she lined them with uh, another pot and let it just be like a catch pot or something. Yeah, So good it, idea. It is. I mean, you don't have to toss them if you do have them. There's other uses. Absolutely. I mean, there's there's all kinds of creative uses you can, you can use. When I'm buying a new container for somebody, I'm not buying metal. You know what I mean? Avoid it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, More absolutely. Options. I mean, for some smaller things, like sometimes I do plant centerpieces or little, it's fine for that, but yes. So my question is, does a spring look to that, or do you change out the containers for that client? Oh, I change it out. Change out the container, <laughs> or just the plants? Just the plants. Okay. Yeah, so for the spring, I put in some variegated ivy and a Wygela shrub is what I put in there. And that was it, and she loved it. You know, so this this is a really fun client. This is in Beacon Hill. Um, they wanted though there were a lot of challenges here with this particular one. Is so she's on this is on there's a sidewalk right there. She's on the top of Beacon Hill. There's a lot of students that come by. There's some bars at the bottom, you know, on Charles Street. So you got some of that late night, you know, people you know walking by. And she would get so frustrated because in the morning she would come outside to water her window boxes and her plants would be on the ground. Because someone comes by and they yank it out and they throw it on the ground and, you know, this kind of thing. And it's frust yeah, it's frustrating. We're in a high traffic area. These are some of the things that I have to think about. So she didn't want anything. I don't want anything sticking out. I don't want anything that's going to draw attraction. I really want the brick paid attention to, and I want everything to be complimented, complimentary and tight and, you know, tidy. I'm like, okay, I can do this. So I show up, on, and I put all of the plants on the sidewalk, and I've got things sticking out everywhere, and she's, she comes out, and she's looking <laughs> give, And I go, all right. <laughs> I go, let me install one window, and you go inside, and we, I'll call you when we're done. You come back. And then we'll, we'll look at it. And if you don't like it, I will come up with another solution. Fair enough? No problem. So she goes back into the house. She comes back. Are you done yet? I'm like, get back in that house. <laughs> <laughs> she and I are wonderful friends. And we're going, she, we go to like garden tours together and all this kind of stuff. So what we did is we packed, you know, we obviously have a lot of color here um, without flowers. You know what I mean? The foliage creates the color. I have curly willow. I may have put the sticks on there. When you're using the sticks, one thing I want to say, use a lot of them. A lot of them. I mean, this is one bunch of branches, sticks, whatever you want to call them. In one container, depending on the size, I'd probably use four of these, at least. Yeah. I mean, because if you only use a few, it's like, eh. you know, it's, it's like the job's not finished. So when you, you think, like, do I have enough? The answer is no, and add at least five more, <laughs> okay? So if you ever question yourself, <laughs> that's how it should go. Um, so you can kind of see the list there. Make sure I don't forget about those. Um, I have fountain grass in here. I have arborvitae in here, believe it or not, but a teeny tiny arborvitaes. I have heuchera again. Um, the Carrick silver sage, that is a grass. And what we did for, and I have a close-up in here, hoping you could see it. So this little piece here, 
That is actually a grass. We braided it. We folded it over and tucked it in because we really liked the color of that sort of brightness that it was bringing in, and it complemented the other colors in there. So have some fun with your grasses. I mean, you see some in there. You might walk right by it because it's kind of drooping over, and it's got a funny shape, and you don't know really what to do with it. Have some fun. Braid it. Tuck it in. Let it hang over. Like, wrap it around things. I mean, it's, it, you can have some pretty stunning effects with it. And then, of course, the ajuga, which is a favorite of mine in the fall because it's got that dark, shiny leaf, and there's nothing else that really quite is like that. So I already talked about getting creative with grasses. Um, how are we doing? So I should, how are we doing on time? Like, you all running to get out of here? Or should I take, because I haven't gotten to winter yet, but that's pretty short. You're all, you're all okay? Okay. Oh, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, this is a bar restaurant that I have in Waltham, and this was kind of a fun fall one because they, this client is like, I want some oomph, I want something showy, I want people to pay attention to me, you know, that's why you would do that, and this is a, a pub, like an Irish pub kind of you know, environment, and if you're an Irish pub, you kind of have to have flowers, <laughs> you know what I mean, if you go to Ireland or England and you see the pubs, they all have flowers and plants, all of them, right, or most of them. So for two six-foot long window boxes, I have in here 12 ornamental millet, Jade Princess in this particular. Now, when you look at this window, you think, there's more than six in that window, right? So when I say 12, that's 12 containers. So there's six containers in this, but there were three in each container. So I took it out of the container, I opened it up, and created a line out of it and planted those. So that's why it looks like it's so much more. Because you know, you, you sometimes buy a container of something like this and you like, oh, there's like five in there, you know? So I take advantage of that. Um, I have s painted fern in here. I have a, a few different varieties of Hugara or coral bells as a nice filler. And then I have some variegated ivy that I had left over from their summer installation. And it was still very healthy and looked very nice. So I kept it and brought other plants in to make it all work together. Now, we can't talk about fall and not talk about pumpkins and gourds, <laughs> right? So here's some things that, uh, rules that I really go by. So use odd numbers, okay? That is the magic to it. Whatever it is that you do, just use an odd number. Three, five, seven, whatever it is. Don't be afraid of using weird shapes and sizes. So those are the ones I'm going for, where other people might be running away from them. Um, you know, funky things that look like geese or a star shaped with lots of bumps on it, um, like a yellowy color more than an orange or greens or even those black kind of, you know, looking colors. Um, and you start putting those together, like those, those I love that combination of those, um, the green gourds with like the black ones. It's such a cool combination. There's green inside that black, and when you put that light green next to it, it really brings it out, and it's very complimentary. So just like when I'm in the garden center, or when you're in the garden center, and you find a plant that you love, put it next to other things, and you'll start to see something you know, coming out that you may not have realized before. Same with the gourds. I put them on my cart, and I just set them up. Like, what is this window box gonna look like? And I set up the window box, or set up the container, right on my cart and design while I'm shopping. You know, I don't usually go to the store or the garden center or Cavicchio and say, okay, I need this many heuchera and this many Rex begonia and because if they don't look good, then I don't want to commit to a client and, and buy the plant just because I, you know, thought ho hopefully it'll look good today. But if it doesn't, no, I go for color or, you know, height and, you know, all those different things that I've talked about so far. You don't want to commit to a plant, really, for those reasons. So this is a home in Stoneham that wanted me to dress up their front. They're having an event or a party or something. And so this is just a good example of some, you know, pumpkin and gourd combinations in odd numbers, you know, just a little bit. I mean, tilting them and playing with them and, you know, messing around with them. It's, it's kind of hard to go wrong a little bit. Um, this is a fun one I put in there that I did for Halloween. So this is an odd mix of plants that probably might not have considered. So the outside, the green, that's, that's holly. You know, it's like thorny and kind of scary looking. And then on top of that, I layered it with mondo grass, which is a black, you know, it's actually more of a ground cover, but it's a black ornamental grass. 
inside of that, I stuck in those gourds that look like the geese, you know what I mean? I always yeah. think of birds because the stem looks like a beak. Mm -hmm. And I find, found many gourds and I stuck them all the way around. They look like monsters kind of coming out of the grass. And then found some branches or sticks that had like a green sort of fuzz on them. It, I got those at Jacobson's. It was Jacobson's is like a floral supply. So you know it over there. Um, and the Boston Flower Exchange in Boston on Albany Street. And they had some bizarre ones. And it just, the combination was fantastic. And I just found some, you know, fun gourds. And this is for a house with children and lots of trick-or-treaters. And so it just did something, you know, for that one house that isn't really into Halloween. <laughs> On to winter. Um, sun and shade considerations are a non-issue in winter. It does not matter what you do as far as that goes. So it's not a factor when designing containers for winter. The plants will not grow. <laughs> Nothing will happen. What you see is how it's going to stay all the way, you know, forever. Um, I definitely, maybe not water at all even in winter. It depends on when you're putting it in. If it's going in in January, forget it. Plant it and forget it. If it's going in in December, maybe water it. Depends how warm it is. Maybe once a week mm, or maybe not at all. You know, it just kind of depends on how warm it is here because we know December can be you know, you can be wearing shorts one day and a parka the next. So it's, it's rare that you're in shorts in December here, but it happens. Um, some of my winter favorites for winter containers, juniper, holly, boxwood, galtheria, your winter green or your winter berry, as some people call it, euonymus, um, sticks and branches. Like I said, don't skimp. Um, evergreen branches, my absolute favorite are incense cedar branches. I just love them. They have those like, look like little berries and things on them. Um, and pine cones. So I'll use lots and lots of pine cones. Some of them I can buy with the, the sticks already glued on them and I just jam them in. But use, just like the branches, lots and lots and lots of them. Unless they're huge. Some of them are like this big and I'll only use a few in that particular case. Um, one thing I wanted to mention for um, winter is also don't be afraid of the fake stuff. I'm not really into the fake stuff, but when I'm doing a container, um, something, you, get, you know, what's Christmas without glitter? <laughs> you will have glitter on you for passing that around, but that has a nice soft green to it. Um, I can break that up so I don't have to just take that whole thing and, and jam it into a container. But it's pretty and it's soft and it gives a little bit of shine. Um, these kinds of like grapevine balls, on sticks, not on sticks, you can wire them in. Um, with floral wire, you know, as well, you all familiar with floral wire? I brought a roll just in case, lots of different gauges, but you don't even need a lot of it. Just a little bit and twist it, and that's all you need is it bites me back. Um, and then these kinds of all different kind of grapevine balls, you know, I only brought one that I had left over. So there's lots of different things that you can play with since the plants are so limited and what you can do. Um, this is for a home in Wellesley Hills that is a client of mine. Um, I did an absolute ton of work for them over the winter, Christmas tree and all kinds of stuff. Um, but this is a dwarf Alberta that I put, a conifer that I put inside some containers. And the containers aren't even that big, but I wanted to give it some real height. They were having a very high-end party. Um, part of the party was going to be a fire pit on their patio. So these containers had to have some wow factor, and this is what resulted. Um, I loaded it up with incense cedar and white pine, um, and there was some hugra left in there, some coral bells from the summer installation, and they were so healthy because it was so warm in December, and I said, I'm going to leave it, and it had that nice sort of purpley you know, color with the different greenery, and it was a really nice um, combination. Um, this is a, another um, pub restaurant where I put in some variegated boxwood that was just chopped at the top. Um, the, 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 the evergreen branches that are flowing over, that's the incense cedar. I love the behavior of it because it's a bit heavy and it's really droopy. Um, so it has that lovely, you know, sort of falling over, you know, very wintry feel. This is winter, but it doesn't have to feel Christmassy. You know what I mean? There's so many really beautiful things you can do without feeling Christmassy. Um, and those are small blue star juniper with lots and lots and lots of pine cones, lots of pine cones that I stuck in there. Really simple. There's only three different plants in there. You know, and sometimes simple is really the best way to go. Um, this is a home in Newtonville. 
And this plant has euonymus, um, blue Pacific juniper, Galtheria, which I love to use in winter. It's just so pretty and, and so, so nice. A gold lace juniper, which is going to give it that yellow factor. Um, the yellow evergreens are the first ones that sell out at Cavicchio's in winter. I mean, you have to get there early and like buy everything yellow you can find because that's the only brightness that we have for an evergreen for a container like this. Um, and then red sticks, just lots and lots and lots of, you know, branches and sticks and that kinds of things. All right, bows. Have to, you got to have bows, right, if you're uh, doing reeds and things like that. So um, I can show you, if people are interested, I did bring some ribbon. The, the secret to bows, I can show you how to make some bows because I do an absolute ton of them. Um, this, the secret to a good bow is just get wired ribbon and go big. Like I say here, go big or go home. <laughs> Lots of loops, lots of large loops. Um, you can have some fun with the wire, like these sort of twirly things I do. All I do is twist it and let it go, and it stays that way. Um, I like to use some fun color combinations. So I've got that, you know, that bright, like the one in the middle is that brighter gold, and then a dark brown with some glitter in, you know, sort of like woven into the ribbon. And it's a nice, classy combination. And it, it's funny because the mailbox on that door, the mail slot is gold, and it all just like worked out really nicely. On the left, that's a little more fun, a little more playful. I combined a plaid with a glittery um, ribbon that has some of the same colors in the plaid in the glittery ribbon and the, they really, it was very playful. The colors really work even though you might not imagine putting these two patterns together. But again, play around, hold the ribbons together. Do these really look nice together? And you might surprise, be surprised at what you can find. And on the right was a really fun, that's actually inside a home in a mud room and they have a dog. And so I used a thinner burlap ribbon with paw prints on it and used another one, <laughs> another burlap ribbon with some branches and, and so forth on it and put them together. And it was fun and sweet. And they have a lot of kids, so it was, it was appreciated. All right, so any questions? All right, I know it's a lot of information. <laughs> All right, so if, there's, if you're interested in this time, I, we could actually plant a couple of containers if anyone wants to come up. I, c I could have either one person or two people or even more if people are really excited about doing it, um, about getting their hands dirty, literally. I have three sets of gloves that I brought, so if you want to wear gloves, I have them. If you don't, that's fine too. I have two mediums and a large, but the med they run a little small, as we know, so I wear the mediums even though I might typically be a small. All right, so I will clear this projector off of here, and you all can, you can come up, you can, you know, whatever, whatever works. Yeah. Thank you for having me. <laughs>